Well, good morning, Walden Church. I'm sure that we've all heard the old saying, a chip off the old block, or uh, it's the flip side of the same coin, or the apple doesn't seem to fall far from the tree. Like father, like son. Well, she sure lives up to the family name. All of these phrases, they're either complimentary or not, <laughs> seem to somehow infer that parents are to blame or they're responsible for how kids turn out, whether it's for better or for worse. But I don't know that they're wrong. I mean, in other words, we say these phrases because there's a little bit of truth there, right? Children in general do turn out to be somewhat like their parents. In fact, social scientists and genetic researchers have identified all kinds of cycles and traits that seem to loop from one generation to the next. Much of your family life is essentially a rehearsal for the next generation to come. Each generation is a link in a long chain and we pass that on to our kids. Children imitate their parents. They become like their parents. You became like your parents. Sometimes uh, you'll hear your parent's voice when you talk, or you'll see your parent's face in the mirror. Paul writes to the Corinthian church, and we all with unveiled face, beholding the glory of the Lord, are being transformed into the same image from one degree of glory to another. For this comes from the Lord who is the Spirit. So it seems Paul even agrees that if God is our heavenly Father and we look to Jesus, hopefully we become like Jesus. Paul uses the Greek word for behold as katoprizo, which means to show in a mirror, or it means to reflect, like as if you're looking into glass. You know, there's a famous hymn that says, turn your eyes upon Jesus, look full in his wonderful face, and the things of earth will grow strangely dim in the light of his glory and grace. Today we're in Matthew chapter 17, and it's about looking at Jesus, beholding Jesus. Both Jesus looking at God and then the disciples looking at Jesus. And we're going to read our chapter today and perhaps see what you and I can reflect. Chapter 17, verse 1 says, And after six days Jesus took with him Peter, James, and John, his brother, and led them up a high mountain by themselves, and he was transfigured before them, and his face shone like the sun, and his clothes became white as light. And behold, there appeared to them Moses and Elijah talking with them. And Peter said to Jesus, Lord, if it is good that we are here, if you wish, I will make three tents here, one for you, and one for Moses, and one for Elijah. He was still speaking, when behold, a bright cloud overshadowed them, and a voice from the cloud said, This is my beloved Son, with whom I am well pleased. Listen to him. When the disciples heard this, they fell on their faces and were terrified. But Jesus came and touched them, saying, Rise and have no fear. And when they lifted up their eyes, they saw no one but Jesus only. And as they were coming down the mountain, Jesus commanded them, Tell no one the vision until the Son of Man is raised from the dead. And the disciples asked him, then why do the scribes say that Elijah must come? He answered, Elijah does come, and he will restore all things. But I tell you that Elijah has already come. And they did not recognize him, but did to him whatever they pleased. So also the Son of Man will certainly suffer at their hands. Then the disciples understood that he was speaking to them of John the Baptist. Here in this story, we see a picture of Jesus' divine glory. So I would say, behold, right? Look. Look at Jesus' divine glory. In theological circles, we call this story the transfiguration. And it sounds like a word that we don't know, but it's actually a word that we do know. It just means transformed, to go from one thing to another. Jesus was made a little different. He had one appearance, and then that appearance changed, and he had a different appearance. And the Bible tells us what that transformation looked like. And he was transfigured before them, and his face shone like the sun, and his clothes became white as light. So everything about Jesus becomes a little brighter. His face, his clothing, it all got turned up to 11. 
And when you witness that, I'm sure that you're able to recognize that something is happening. This is not normal. And the Bible says, behold, right? There's our word again. But this time it says, behold, to mean look, right? Look. Jesus starts to become brighter. And Matthew says, look, Moses and Elijah are here. They are? Why are Moses and Elijah here? That's a, that's a great question. I mean, why wouldn't it be King David? You know, we said that Jesus is the new King David. Why isn't it Adam? Jesus is also the new Adam. Jesus is the new firstborn son. So why is it Moses and Elijah? Well, if you remember, last week was Peter's confession of faith. Jesus asked, who do people say that I am? And Peter said, you are the Christ, right? You are the Messiah, you are the son of the living God. So we got that out of the way. And now there's no more secrecy. Jesus says, who am I? And now we know his identity. So it's time for Jesus to take the disciples behind the curtain and he gives them a super exclusive behind the scenes tour and you and I, as the reader, we get to go with. The disciples have already worshiped Jesus as God. So now they get to see a fraction of what his glory looks like. And then we have these two great Old Testament heroes, Elijah, the great prophet, Moses, the great lawgiver, and both of them now have something in common, a, a huge thing in common with Jesus that Matthew wants you to notice. Let's look briefly at both of them and start with Moses, right? Because right now, Jesus is on a mountain and he's meeting with God, but did Moses ever do that? Of course, Moses is one of the handful of people who went up on a mountain and was in God's presence. Here. Look at Exodus chapter 33, verses 18 through 23. Moses said, please show me your glory. And God said, I will make all my goodness pass before you and will proclaim before you my name, the Lord. And I'll be gracious to whom I will be gracious and I will show mercy on whom I will show mercy. But he said, you cannot see my face for man shall not see me and live. And the Lord said, behold, there's a place by me where you shall stand on the rock and while my glory passes by, I will put you in a cleft of the rock and I will cover you with my hand until I have passed by. Then I will take away my hand and you shall see my back, but my face shall not be seen. The Lord said to Moses, cut for yourself two tablets of stone like the first, and I will write on the tablets the words that were on the first tablets which you broke. Be ready by the morning and come up in the morning to Mount Sinai and present yourself there to me on the top of the mountain. No one shall come up with you, and let no one be seen throughout all the mountain. Let no flocks or herds graze upon the mountain. So Moses cut two tablets of stone like the first, and he rose early in the morning and went up on Mount Sinai, as the Lord had commanded him, and took in his hand two tablets of stone. The Lord descended in the cloud and stood with him there and proclaimed the name of the Lord. The Lord passed before him and proclaimed, The Lord, the Lord a God merciful and gracious, slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love and faithfulness, keeping steadfast love for thousands, forgiving iniquity and transgression and sin, but who will by no means clear the guilty, visiting the iniquity of the fathers on the children and the children's children to the third and fourth generation. And Moses quickly bowed his head toward the earth and worshiped. When Moses came down from the mountain with the two tablets of the testimony in his hand, as he came down the mountain, Moses did not know that the skin of his face shone because he had been talking with God. Aaron and all the people of Israel saw Moses and behold, the skin of his face shone and they were afraid to come near him. In this passage, God comes close to Moses and Moses is closer to God than anyone. And when he comes back, he's wearing God's reflection. And we're seeing this, right? We're seeing this. Moses was on a mountain with God. And when he came back, his face was brighter, his clothes were brighter. Moses was transfigured. He was transformed. And, and who was Moses for these people? He was the great lawgiver. Then we have Elijah, the greatest prophet of God. Did Elijah have an encounter with God on a mountain? Yes. 
1 Kings 18, God assists Elijah on Mount Carmel. We talked briefly about this when we covered the death of John the Baptist. Elijah challenged Queen Jezebel's God to a duel, and her gods failed miserably. Elijah publicly shamed her. Subsequently, Jezebel wanted to kill Elijah, and so Elijah hides out in a cave on a mountain. 1 Kings 19 says, There he came to a cave and lodged in it, and behold, the word of the Lord came to him. And he said to him, What are you doing here, Elijah? He said, I have been very jealous for the Lord, the God of hosts, for the people of Israel have forsaken your covenant, thrown down your altars, and killed your prophets with the sword. And I, even I only, am left. And they seek my life to take it away. And he said, Go out and stand on the mount before the Lord. And behold, the Lord passed by, and a great and strong wind tore the mountains and broke in pieces the rocks before the Lord. But the Lord was not in the wind. And after the wind, an earthquake, but the Lord was not in the earthquake. And after the earthquake, a fire, but the Lord was not in the fire. And after the fire, the sound of a low whisper. And when Elijah heard it, he wrapped his face in his cloak and went out and stood at the entrance of the cave. And behold, there came a voice to him that said, What are you doing here, Elijah? Elijah, the great prophet, also has an encounter with God on a mountain. And now Jesus follows both of these examples, meets God on a mountain along with the other two Bible heroes that we just read about, and they had both been on mountains. And they are both representations of Scripture, of the Law and the Prophets. And this is why John would later write, and the Word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we have seen his glory. Glory as of the only Son from the Father, full of grace and truth. This is why the author of Hebrews writes, He is the radiance of the glory of God and the exact imprint of his nature, and he upholds the universe by the word of his power. After making purifications for his sins, he sits down at the right hand of the majesty on high. But, of course, to be in God's presence, the disciples react the same way most people do, when they are in the presence of a heavenly being, Peter, James, and John are overcome with fear. They don't know what to do. They don't know what to say. But Peter blurts out, Lord, it's good for us to be here. And if you wish, I will put up three shelters, one for you, one for Moses, and one for Elijah. But he's quickly interrupted by a voice from the cloud that says, this is my son whom I love. With him I am pleased. Listen to him. Now, I'm sure you've heard a pastor say at one time or another that Peter is impetuous and that he doesn't realize what he's saying. But one of the interesting things here about the transfiguration, although God affirms Jesus as his son and that he loves him and that he's pleased with him, he also says, listen to him. And he doesn't even mention Moses or Elijah. Why is that? Why does God say, listen to him? Or does God say this to interject Peter's comment? And does God actually have a different emphasis? Does God say, listen to him? Because as important as Moses and Elijah are, to the Jewish people, Jesus is not among equals. He's different. He's completely different. He is the Son of God. So he is without equal. The story of the transfiguration actually started for both of us in the previous chapter that we read last week. When Jesus came to the region of Caesarea Philippi, he asked his disciples, who do people say the Son of Man is? They replied, some say John the Baptist, others say Elijah and still others, Jeremiah, or one of the prophets. But what about you, he asked? Who do you say that I am? Simon Peter answered, You are the Christ, the Son of the living God. And Jesus replied, Blessed are you, Simon Barjona, for this was not revealed to you by man, but by my Father in heaven. And I tell you that you are Peter, and on this rock I will build my church, and the gates of hell will not overcome it. Jesus is not another John the Baptist. And he's not another Elijah. He's not Jeremiah. He's not one of the other prophets. He is unique. He is without equal. 
And especially in our generation, we need to understand that Jesus is not just another religious leader. He's not another teacher. He's unique. He stands alone. There is no one that you can compare him with. And what's interesting is, right after that, Matthew says that when the disciples then look up after having uh, cowering in fear, the Bible says they saw, no, they saw no one but Jesus. Moses was gone. Elijah was gone. Jesus is there by himself. No one is like him. No one can be compared with him. He is one of a kind. He is alone. He is unique. He is the only savior of the world. And the transfiguration continues to answer this question, who is Jesus? But again, we shouldn't fault the disciples. They don't know any better. I mean, look at it from Peter's point of view. He had just seen God's glory revealed in the flesh. So the natural thing for him to think is we should build a place of worship right here where God is. He just didn't realize that Jesus didn't come to dwell in a fixed position. He came to dwell in us. Jesus came to live in living hearts, not a building. Our hands become Christ's hands and we help. Our eyes become the eyes of Christ and we see the things that God is anxious for and our feet become Christ's feet and we bring the salvation to those who need it. The point of the transfiguration is not just to point at Jesus, but it's also to point to a reality that the kingdom of God is not just out there or up there, but it's right here. It's with us. And it's a point I think people miss, even though we look for it. You know, like, like if you're looking for your car keys and they're just right there in your pocket. Peter wanted to mark the spot. You know, he wanted to make the spot sacred. He wanted to set up three shelters, three different places of worship. And he doesn't realize that the whole world is now sacred. The whole world belongs to God. Once having been asked by the Pharisees where the kingdom of God would come, Jesus replied in Luke 17, the kingdom of God does not come with your careful observation, nor will people say here it is or there it is because the kingdom of God is within you. You know, we're so used to thinking about heaven as being a place that you go to after you die. We think of it as being somewhere out there or up, right? Heaven is up. But Jesus was showing that heaven is all around us. It's within us. It's not something for us only when we die. Heaven is something that we can experience even when we live. The kingdom of God is not for the future. But it's more like the Lord's prayer suggests. The Lord's prayer that we pray says that the kingdom is now in the present. It's here on earth as it is in heaven. So the kingdom of God is not out there in some distant place or some distant future. It's right here. The kingdom of God is not just for church. It's for your home. It's for your place of work. It, it goes with you wherever you go. The story goes on in Matthew. It says, as they were coming down from the mountain, Jesus commanded them, tell no one the vision until the Son of Man is raised from the dead. And the disciples asked him, then why do the scribes say that, the, that first Elijah must come? And he answered, Elijah does come and he will restore all things. But I tell you that Elijah has already come, and they did not recognize him, but did to him whatever they pleased. So also the Son of Man will certainly suffer at their hands. Then the disciples understood that he was speaking to them of John the Baptist. So it seems kind of like, even though the disciples know, Jesus says, we're, gonna, we're still going to keep this a secret, right? And here he says, don't tell anyone what you saw. Can you imagine trying to keep this a secret? I mean, you just saw it, and now you can't tell anyone. This is just another example of how things are not going the way the disciples thought they would go. How can, I mean, first they say, well, how can this be the Messiah if Elijah hasn't come yet? But Elijah came. Yeah, it was John. Yeah, but John's dead. John stood up for what he believed. John said the right things. John did the right things, and now he's dead. That wasn't supposed to happen. 
The coming of the Messiah was supposed to be monumental. It was supposed to be a turn in the road. It was supposed to be a new beginning. It was supposed to be hope. But this event and all the events to come are setting them up to go to the cross because the cross of Christ has to come first. The disciples were looking forward to the crown of Christ. But the cross has to come first. Everything that happens now is Jesus taking them to the cross. Suffering comes first. And this is why Jesus says, don't tell anyone. Because we're not there yet. You know? So now we have Jesus' identity out of the way. We all know who he is. Matthew gives us a little three-point sermon. After he says, look at the glory of Jesus, now he says, look at the power of Jesus. Verse 14 says that when they came to the crowd, a man came up to him and kneeling before him said, Lord, have mercy on my son, for he has seizures and he suffers terribly. For often he falls into the fire and often into the water. And I brought him to your disciples and they could not heal him. And Jesus answered, O faithless and twisted generation, how long am I to be with you? How long am I to bear with you? Bring him here to me. And Jesus rebuked the demon, and it came out of him. And the boy was healed instantly. Then the disciples came to Jesus privately and said, Why could we not cast it out? And he said to them, Because of your little faith. For truly I say to you, if you have faith like the grain of a mustard seed, you will say to this mountain, Move from here to there, and it will move, and nothing will be impossible for you. Remember in this story, Jesus is on the mountain with only three disciples and the rest are back in town trying to help this father and son. And on the surface of this story, we don't really understand what's happening here because on previous occasions, the disciples had cast out demons, yet here they can't cure this boy. So apparently this demon is different than most or more difficult than most, but even though on the outside this looks like a failure, it's still a learning opportunity for them. It teaches them that when you have a problem, <laughs> sometimes you've got to go to Jesus, right? It teaches them that they've got to get out of the rut of doing ministry the same or mechanically or just by rote. It teaches them to trust more in the power of Jesus. Matthew is reminding us again that Jesus has the authority, right? That Jesus has the power over things of this earth and over the supernatural realm. And then we get a hint of the sacrifice of Jesus. Verse 22 says, as they were gathering in Galilee, Jesus said to them, the son of man is about to be delivered into the hands of men and they will kill him and he'll be raised on the third day. And they were greatly distressed. Can you imagine not being able to cast out a demon and then Jesus just steps in and takes care of it and then he turns and says, oh yeah, and by the way, one day you won't have me. I won't be here. <laughs> These two stories, they seem contradictory. Jesus is God. Jesus is all-powerful. He has the authority, right? There's no one like him. He's the God man. And then he says, oh yeah, but I'm going to die. How, how can that happen? Who is powerful enough to overcome Jesus? Who's powerful enough to kill Jesus? I mean, when you watch the movies with Jesus in it, it always looks like, yeah, Jesus put up a good fight, but he lost, right? He's hurt, he's whipped, he's broken, he's defeated, his countenance is down, Rome won, the religious leaders won, but that's not what happened. Jesus says in John 10, no one takes it from me, but I lay it down on my own accord. I have the authority to lay it down and I have the authority to take it back up again. This charge I received from my father. He's talking about his life. He's talking about his life. He says, no one can take it from me. And then he says in John 15, greater love has no one than this, that someone lay down his life for his friends. So the sacrifice of the Messiah was that he willingly laid down his life. When he dies, it's because he chooses to. He has the authority to lay down his own life. We've seen his power. 
Nobody can best Jesus. No one can stand toe-to-toe with Jesus. So he doesn't lose. Rome doesn't win. The disciples are distressed, but they just don't understand that it's not a defeat. It's a victory, but it's a victory over sin. What else can we see? Well, then we see the priorities of Jesus. Verse 24 says, When they came to Capernaum, the collectors of the two drachma tax went up to Peter and said, Does your teacher not pay the tax? He said, Yes. And when he came into the house, Jesus spoke to him first, saying, What do you think, Simon? From whom do kings of the earth take toll or tax? From their sons or from others? And when he said, From others, Jesus said to him, Then the sons are free. However, not to give offense to them, go to the sea and cast a hook and take the first fish that comes up. And when you open its mouth, you will find a shekel. Take that and give it to them for me and for yourself. Now, the story is only found in Matthew, which is ironic because Matthew is also a tax collector. But we're not talking about a Roman tax here. We're talking about a Jewish tax. This is a tax to pay for the upkeep of the temple. And it's a great miracle story, right? They find a coin in a fish. It's fun. But let's just be clear. Jesus does not have to do this. In fact, he could have used this as an opportunity to teach them that you don't really have to worry about upkeep on the temple. One day the temple will be destroyed. And besides, now you and I, our bodies are the temples of God. But one of the most difficult and challenging aspects of the Christian walk is the fact that People are always watching you. Unbelievers, the world, they're always watching you, especially when you fall or when you fail. They watch what you say. They watch what you do. They watch where you go. And the minute they catch you making a mistake, they are very quick to point out that you are a Christian. Oh, I thought you were a Christian. Oh, that's how Christians act. Oh, that's, that's nice. I thought you were a Christian. But we're still human, right? We still make mistakes. But on the other hand, we probably should practice what we preach. We know that the religious elite were already out there. The Pharisees, the Sadducees, they were looking for a way to accuse Jesus. They try to trap him with his words, they try to trap him with the people that he hung out with, but Jesus is too smart for that. He can't be trapped. So in this story, we're talking about Jewish people who are free, and they showed their solidarity with the temple and the Holy Land, and they would pay this half-shekel tax. In the New Testament times, this was two drachmas, as the, text, as the text says, or, or it's two days' wages. After 70, after the year 70, in Matthew's time, the Romans confiscated this tax, and it became upkeep for a pagan temple. And some Jews may have refused to pay it on principle, but in Jesus' day, any Jew loyal to Judaism would have paid it. The temple tax agents are attempting to elicit a affirmative response from Peter. They say, he does pay the tax, doesn't he? And Peter, who's always, you know, slow to speak and quick to listen, <laughs> blurts out, yes, of course he does. First Peter 2 says, keep your conduct among the Gentiles honorable, so that when they speak against you as evildoers, they may see your good deeds and glorify God on the day of visitation. Have you ever heard somebody say, I don't, I don't care what people think of me. I could care less. That's not a good attitude. We need to care what people think. Because what they think about us is a reflection on our Father, on how we were raised. It's a reflection on Jesus. If they see us living lives that are not filled with truth and integrity and honor, then they will think that Jesus is not true. Acts 24 says, I always take pains to have clear conscience toward both God and man. Matthew 5 says, Let your light shine before others so they may see your good works and give glory to your Father who is in heaven. 
Jesus told us to live lives of integrity. He told us to live lives of truth. He told us to live lives of honor. He told us to live lives that bring praise and honor and glory to the Father. Peter goes into the house. Before he even has a chance to speak, Jesus says, what do you think, Peter? Do you think kings tax their own people or do they tax the people they've conquered? What do you think the answer is? Kings of old did not tax their children, did they? No, you tax the foreigner. You tax the oppressed that lives among you. Jesus tells Peter the king doesn't tax his own citizens. They are free. Now, I'm sure the priests of the temple, they didn't pay the tax. So then if Jesus is greater than the temple and he's greater than the priests, then he's not obligated to pay it either. But the Bible says that Jesus didn't want to offend anyone based on tax. So for the sake of those who were watching, for the sake of those who are looking at him, and him wanting his disciples to follow his example, he paid the tax. It wasn't a matter of, do I have to, for Jesus. It was a matter of, I should do it anyway. Jesus shows us that it's not about our personal rights, but rather about doing the right thing because it's the right thing. Oswald Chambers said, in the natural realm, if a person does not hit back, it is because he is a coward. But in the spiritual realm, it is the very evidence of the Son of God in him if he does not hit back. When you are insulted, you must not only not resent it, but you must make it an opportunity to exhibit the Son of God in your life. A personal insult becomes an opportunity for a saint to reveal the incredible sweetness of the Lord Jesus. In other words, sometimes you have to surrender your rights in order to do what's right. Philippians says, Have this mind among yourselves, which is yours in Christ Jesus, who though he was in the form of God, did not count equality with God a thing to be grasped, but emptied himself by taking the form of a servant, being born in the likeness of men, and being found in human form, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. After illustrating to Peter, that he did not have to pay the tax. He pays the tax. Jesus told Peter, we don't want to offend them. Once again, Jesus is illustrating that the church follow his example by doing what? Upholding the law of the land. This not only shows us that the church is a love for people, but it also demonstrates a good witness to the world. Deuteronomy 28 says, The Lord will establish you as a people holy to himself, as he has sworn to you. If you keep the commandments of the Lord your God and walk in his ways, and all the peoples of the earth shall see that you are called by the name of the Lord, and they shall be afraid of you. You know what another popular saying is? It usually happens when you leave a door open, right? You leave the door open and somebody says, were you raised in a barn? Right? <laughs> I started this off by saying, it seems the older we become, the more we seem to grow into our parents. But even before that, our parents would tell us to dress nice, comb our hair, say please and thank you. And it wasn't just for our sake, but also for theirs because it was a reflection on them, how they were raised. We weren't raised in a barn. As Christians, in all circumstances, we should do the right thing because people are watching what we do and it's all a reflection on Jesus. And I'm not talking about your rights or what you should or shouldn't do or what you can or can't do. the right thing. Jesus surrendered his rights. Remember? He surrendered his rights as God for our sake. He surrendered his right, his heirship as God's son for our forgiveness. 
He surrendered his rights as the creator of the universe and was beaten. He surrendered his rights to glory and he became a human who got dirty and who got hungry. Now, did Jesus do this because he was looking forward to the cross? That he was looking forward to being beaten? That he enjoyed being betrayed? No. He did it because he loved this world. And because it was the right thing to do. The most powerful verse in all of Scripture is that for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son. God surrendered that which was most precious for us. And he didn't have to do it. But he gave of himself sacrificially. Jesus gave of himself sacrificially. And he didn't have to do it, but he forced him to do it. He wasn't obligated to do it. But the world was watching. And it was the right thing to do. Let's pray together. Lord, once again, we thank you for the example of your son. We thank you for this book of Matthew and the things that it teaches us. We thank you for the answer to the question, who is Jesus? He is the Christ. He is the Son of God. Lord, in all ways, we acknowledge that you alone are unequaled. And you have the power and the authority to rule this world. Lord, as your church, we follow you all the way to the cross, even to the point of relinquishing our own rights, even to the point of giving up our own comforts for the sake of the gospel, for the sake of the kingdom. May our feet be your feet as we bring the gospel and the good news to the corners of the earth that all may know your precious son. Amen. Once again, thank you for joining us this morning. Of course, we want to remind you that we have church here every Sunday. Uh, we would love to have you be a part of our services. We have two. We have a 930 service, which is our traditional service. We have a choir, and we sing all the hymns that you grew up with. And we have an 11 o'clock service, which is our contemporary service. We have a worship band, and it's also the same hour that we have our full children's program. So from nursery all the way through high school, we have Sunday school for everyone across the way. And on Wednesdays, we also have youth group. So whether your family attends our church or not, your children are always welcome to attend our youth group every single Wednesday at six o'clock. They can ride their bikes or their skateboards or just walk on over. We'll keep them for about an hour and a half and we will even feed them dinner before we send them home to you. Thanks for watching once again and we wanna be the church where you live. I'll see you guys next week, bye.